1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of man and of angels and have not charity, I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing. Char charity suffereth long and is kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunted not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but where there is prophecies, they shall fail. Where there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, as a child I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. And now abide of faith, hope, and charity. These, these, three, these three, but the greatest of these is charity or love. And we need to have that heart of God in our ministry of God's love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for God is of, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifest the love of God towards us, because that God sent his might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved is if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. So, first of all, we preach with our lives, but then we preach the gospel in John 15, 27. John 15, 27. And you also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. The disciples were to bear witness to, uh, of Christ, were to show forth Christ. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 to 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 to 24. One Corinthians chapter one, verse eighteen to twenty-four says, "For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world?" For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Greeks' foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul was to preach the gospel he was to preach Christ. He was to preach a crucified Christ. He was to preach the gospel. If you turn to Galatians uh, chapter 1, verse 6 and 9. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 9. says, I marvel that you are, not, you are so soon removed from him that called you into an... So... so 
removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. We said before, so say I any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Paul preached the gospel. He never compromised on it, but he preached it. Too often today, people are compromising as ministers on preaching the gospel. They will not preach the whole counsel of God in the gospel. They will not preach about the wrath of God on sin. They will not preach the holiness of God. They will not preach the need to repent and turn away from sin. They will not preach on the cross. They want to get into clever apologetics or they want to talk about psychology and, and all the rest of it. But they put in things and don't preach the cross of Christ. They'll even not even preach. They'll put on drama or they'll put on films or they'll, they'll put on worship and all the rest of it. But very few ministers these days will actually preach the gospel. Will get up and give a 35-minute, 40 the crucifixion of Christ and say come to believe in Christ it is the only way to be saved and so we're compromising on the gospel if you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18 to 20 and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us, what? The word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ had be reconciled to God. Did you get that? is a minister, an ambassador of God. Now if an ambassador is sent on a mission, the ambassador has to take the message of the leadership of the city, of the leadership of the, of the nation. The ambassador cannot change the message. So often today we forget as ministers that we're ambassadors of God and we dare not change the message. It's his message. But so often today ministers dare tamper with the message. They try to dumb the message down. They try to make a new message that is not the Christian message of the gospel. And so they are failing and causing shipwreck within their own faith and the faith of many because they will not preach the crucifixion of Christ. They will not be ambassadors of God and plainly declare what God has said. So we need to our life we need to preach the gospel clearly and uncompromisingly but we need to preach in the power of the Holy Spirit we cannot do this without his aid if you turn to John 15 26 turn to John 15 26 but when the comfort, Comforter is come, whom I send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. This work that we do as ministers, this work that we do as preachers, or whatever ministry that we have, this work is done in the aid and power of the Holy Spirit. It is God's work and God equips for us to do this work. And the equipment is the Holy Spirit. If we turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. Verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Ghost, in much assurance as you know the manner of men we were among you for your sake you see when they preached it came in the demonstration of the spirit and of power and there are my friend as a reformed pastor or as a pastor or a, as a preacher 
let me tell you something. There is the Holy Spirit, and he anoints preachers. If you don't believe me, read Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones book, Preaching of Preachers, and read the last chapter. Too often, as pastors and preachers, we are preaching and not expecting the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will do a work through your preaching. He will anoint you and give you power in your preaching. If you don't know anything of this power, there is something wrong with you. For God gives it to those who want to, who are called to preach the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You can't force God's hand here. He will give the Spirit in measure as he sees fit. But you can be expectant to expect the Holy Spirit to give you power. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, but that you should be not be grieved, but that you might know the love that I have. Sorry, I'm, I'm, wrong passage there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 4 and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power now I want to just say a little thing here which is very important I am a great believer in apologetics uh, the last few years I've spent quite a bit of time reading apologetics and it's been a great blessing I need to get back to reading more theology it's been a great blessing a great help and it's been a great equipment in in talking to people to be able to know various answers to questions etc but it, it is absolutely fatal in preaching if we rely on the intellect and not the Holy Spirit The Holy Spirit is the one that do his work. I'm not saying that ministers shouldn't study apologetic books by all means, but never put your trust in that. Put your trust in the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the message that he is giving you to preach. Trust in God and the equipment that he has given you. One writer says we need bold biblical Christ-centered preaching in our day that is anointed preaching Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek he hath sent me to bind up the liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. John MacArthur says, according to scripture, 